Welcome to my YouTube channel. I'm Dr. Angel Storm. I'm a narcissistic abuse recovery coach. Thank you so much for tuning in. Today I want to talk to you about the legal and financial implications of leaving a narcissistic partner. And I want to do this video specifically so that you can understand the intricacies that, that need to be considered when you are making an escape plan or you are thinking about making an escape plan. I think one of the things that's most often overlooked is how difficult it is to unhook every single tie that you have to the narcissist uh, when you're trying to leave that person, right? So every single thing that you, uh, you have together in common with the narcissist, every child, every loan, every bank account, every residence, every vehicle, any other asset that you have, each one of these things is its, is its own tie to the narcissist. And if you wanna truly be free of the narcissist, then you have to think about how every single one of those physical bonds can be broken as well as breaking the trauma bond. So let's get started. I, I think it's really important again to understand the difficult and complicated process that it is to uh, leave and untangle yourself from a narcissist and that there are legal and financial implications of making this decision if you are married, if you have children together, if you are living together, if you own a business together. Narcissistic individuals have a personality disorder, right, which is often characterized by this grandiose sense of self-importance, their lack of empathy for others, their excessive need for admiration to never be wrong. And this, these traits about your narcissistic partner can make it very difficult for you to leave. It can, it can feel overwhelming. It can feel very daunting because you're not sure how they will react and they're often unpredictable anyway. And sometimes they're very dangerous as well, right? But understanding the legal and financial implications of leaving can help you make informed decisions and can also help protect you uh, as you are going about this process of leaving. So one of the most important legal implications of leaving a narcissist is the issue of domestic violence. And uh, again, I've talked about this before, but we have a very limited understanding of what domestic violence actually is. Because if you are not including uh, intimidation, coerce coercion, um, any form of control, then you are not considering the fullness of what domestic violence means, right? Because all of these things lead to and increase the risk of physical harm. And there are crucial steps that you can take in order to protect yourself before leaving, like you can obtain a restraining order if one is necessary. Uh, and also another thing that you can do is to make sure that you start documenting everything, right? You want to track every interaction. You want to not be alone with the narcissist. And especially if you're planning to leave the narcissist, you don't want to do that on your own. You want to tell other people, you want to inform other people about your plan and have them, uh, with you when you are, are wanting to either, you know, move, move your things. Or if you want the narcissist to leave, I have a whole video that talks about how to get the narcissist to leave your house, the house that you share, the home that you share, um, uh, when they when they refuse to do so, there are steps that you can take in order to make sure that none of the none of the actions that you are about to take to separate yourself from the narcissist can be used against you later on in the in a legal sense, right? Um, there's also other things, you know. Every um, county is different. Every state is different. Um, every country is different. So your county may have um, uh, programs for em emergency housing um, and counseling services. And so you want to really look into what your uh, what your county offers, um, because the more things that you can take advantage of, the more education that you have, the more resources that you have, the more options open up to you. You also want to consider the legal issue of dividing the assets in the property, right? Because narcissists will try to control all aspects of your life, including the finances and the property. And by the way, if you if you know that you are married to a narcissist and you do not have access to your bank accounts, you do not actually have access to uh, financial records, You uh, your name is not on deeds to properties or homes, you need to, again, be educated about what your state says, because sometimes in, in a lot of states are 50-50 states, meaning that it doesn't matter if your name is actually on the deed or not. 
It doesn't matter if, if your name is on the bank account or not. If you two are legally married or if you have a common law marriage, then you are automatically entitled to half of the equity in the home or whatever other asset, such as the bank account. You're also on the hook for half of the debt. This is why it's so important that you understand what's going on with the financial aspect of your life, especially if you are married. So you need to start making decisions that enable you to get access and be on these accounts, right? You need to have an understanding of what's going on because this is one of the most um, uh, time-consuming aspects of, of getting a divorce or getting a custody order set in place is understanding the financial aspects when you're dealing with a narcissist because they will typically not uh, divulge this information to their partners. Uh, beforehand. And so you you may end up needing to hire a forensic accountant to actually go through and find uh, money or other assets. Uh, so again, know your rights, know what, what your rights are in your state, in your county, before you you move forward with any type of process. You want to just be in the gathering information process before you file anything legally. You need to know uh, you know, as much information as you have, as you can before you do that so that you can make an informed decision. So again, gather information of the, of, of your own financial contributions to the relationship. So if you have your own, um, job and you have pay stubs, you have bank statements, you want to make sure that you are doing, uh, you are, you are monitoring and managing your money first. So, all of your own contributions. Go find and track down your pay stubs, your tax statements, your bank statements, okay? Um, and again, your you need to know what you are bringing to the table and what you have contributed before you start going after what the narcissist has done. Again, um, things like withholding money or sabotaging your employment opportunities are things or tactics that the narcissist can and will use. And so... Um, and so again, you need to know the legal definitions of what abuse is because this falls underneath that category. And if you do not frame this, if you do not frame what you have been experiencing in a legal manner under the definition, the legal definition of abuse, when you go to court, you are automatically going to be behind the eight ball because the narcissist is going to try to deflect and use similar patterns of behavior that you two have engaged in. If you're saying the narcissist calls me names and he's going to say, or she's going to say, she also calls me names or he also calls me names. The, the, the narcissist is going to try to muddy the water. And if you don't present it from a legal standpoint, you are automatically already on the losing end because you are entering the legal court system. This is a legal system, not a justice system. You need to know the legal definitions of things. So when you understand what you have contributed, you understand that the narcissist is, is committing abuse. You are no longer just saying, hey, the narcissist is doing this activity. You are using the legal definition. Hey, this is financial abuse. This is sabotaging my employment opportunities. This is, this is a form of violence against me. You need to know these things, right? So that you can work together with your attorney to formulate a strategy. You need to know what your budget is. Going back to the financial aspects, you need to create a budget. You need to have the narcissist buy in, especially if you are living together. You need to have something in writing stating that, yes, that's an accurate budget. Why? Because you will have to reveal financial documents in court once you enter into the legal system. Again, you will have to show these things. That is an easy way to catch a narcissist in a lie if they already have a buy-in for the budget ahead of time before you filed. So creating a budget, you want to have that. You want to um, have a conversation and document it. So if you have the conversation in person, you want to send a follow-up text message or follow-up email. Hey, just checking on our conversation last night where we agreed that I would have my own separate bank account. When's a good time for you to set that up with me? Or, uh, or how much money can I expect to be able to put into my new separate bank account? You want to follow up on the conversations that you are having in person with something in writing so that you you have a leg a legal leg to stand on again once you enter the legal system um and again there are things that you can do to also establish credit uh for yourself 
in your own name so that when if you do need to enter into the legal system you need your own credit you need to get your own place or uh, you need to make a purchase that you've never had to make before you have credit to um to lean back on and if you need help repairing your credit or you want to start establishing credit please contact um, a person that I work with closely on my other business. His name is Jeff. His contact information is in the description of this video. Please reach out to him. Let him know I sent you and he can help you establish your own credit, rebuild your own credit. Okay. So that you are able to, um, rebuild your life, repair your life. Once you have, uh, separated from the narcissist or even now while you're preparing to separate from the narcissist. Okay. Leaving a narcissistic partner is emotionally draining, right? And so you need to think about how you are going to fill up your emotional bank account. And why does that matter? Because if you do not do that, you are not going to make sound financial decisions, sound legal decisions while you are going through this process of separating yourself from the narcissist. This is why it is so uh, important that you take care of your inner world first. Everything that's happening in your outer world is a reflection of what's already been going on in your inner world, okay? So you need to understand your uh, your county's resources, understand your state and federal law uh, about abuse, about what legal definitions are. You need to find an attorney who can help you present your case in a legal manner, not just, um, you know, I want, I want everybody to know that he does A, B, and C, or she did X, Y, and Z to me. That's not a legal case that doesn't help you actually get the outcome that you want. And then you finally need to start taking steps to separate yourself financially. You need to have your own budget. You need to have your own bank account. You need to have your own credit score. You need to have these things established apart from the narcissist, no matter how long, you know, the narcissist has been doing this for X amount of years or X amount of decades. Now is the time to start making a new habit. So start putting some effort into getting these things together. I do want to take some time and address this from the standpoint of a stay-at-home mom because this is one of the most um, exploited groups of people who want to leave their narcissist partner, but they feel that they have very little options, right? Because they stay at home with the child or the children. And the narcissist just takes care of the bills and takes care of, uh, you know, the things that the family needs. First of all, you need to understand, again, that if you do not have access to all of your financial records, your bank accounts, your name is not on uh, on the, the deed to the house or the car, whatever you may have, you need to understand if, if the narcissist has a credit card and you don't, you're not an authorized user on there and you have your own card uh, tied to that account, you need to understand that that is financial abuse and you need to start calling it that. If you keep saying, well, this is just the division of our uh, of our workload, this is just how we've always done it with our family, think about things that you do that the narcissist doesn't have access to. That would be zero things, isn't it? And so you're not actually a true partner with the narcissist. You are a person who is kept in a cage, who is kept in a very small space and can only do, go, do things, go to places, spend money that the narcissist says you can go or, or do or spend money at. You need to start calling this and start shaping this in your mind as abuse, okay? And you, you need to do what I was saying earlier, which is that you need to start getting on these bank accounts. You need to start creating a budget. You need to sit down with your uh, partner and get buy-in on this. If that's impossible, you need to start making a trail of that, right? There's ways to get what you need in court, but you need to have a legal basis in order to uh, get things such as a financial, an emergency uh, financial uh, motion filed so that you would be established on uh, emergency financial support, right? Typically, that is one of the last things that is discussed in court is the the financial support that, that one person provides the other. Um, there are ways around that, but you need to start building a legal case. So you need to start making documentation of the fact that you have tried to get the narcissist to do these things, but they're unwilling, right? You need to have actual physical evidence of that. Not like I had a conversation and no one witnessed it. You need to have actual uh, emails, text messages. That's why I'm saying if you have an in-person conversation, you follow it up 
with a text message or an email the next day or, you know, an hour or whatever later. Um, you need to also think about the skills that you have as a stay-at-home mom. A lot of people think I'm, I'm just a stay-at-home mom, right? And, and again, the way you think about things, your inner world is going to reflect in your outer world. So if that's how you see yourself, that's how you are going to continue to categorize yourself and keep yourself in a very small space. There's likely skills that you have uh, that you have acquired through your a uh, beautiful journey of being a stay-at-home mom that you can help others with, right? You need to know how to market these skills so that you can start creating your own income if you need to, okay? Um, uh, some, some things can be just as simple as um, organizing, learning how to organize groups of people. So maybe you have organized a play date over here. You've organized a, a help group or a support group for new moms over here. If you're able to do these things, how can you market this ability to organize and bring people together, this, this ability to connect uh, uh, people and places together? This can help not only start building you a financial safety net, but also increasing your own uh, self-worth, the way that you view yourself. Because if you th if you think that you are just a stay-at-home mom, which is uh, often a negative way that the narcissist speaks to you, right? You're just a stay-at-home mom. You don't know how to do that because you just stay at home with the children. You start to believe that about yourself, like this isn't that important. By the way, that's the most important job. Being a parent is the most important job that you will ever have. And so when you start to take on the way that the narcissist thinks about you uh, in you, then it really limits the way that you see how valuable uh, what you have is, right? And that will always limit what you do with that then. Again, you want to make sure that you are creating a budget, you are tracking your expenses carefully because if you know how much your nar the your partner, your narcissistic partner makes, and you also know how much you spend on you know your day-to-day uh, uh, activities as well as like your overall living costs. So you know how much your, your mortgage is, your house payment, uh, you, uh, insurance, anything like this is, you'll know, you can see a discrepancy easily when the narcissist says he makes X amount of dollars or you know he makes X amount of, or she makes X amount of dollars from their W-2 and you know what the budget is, where's the extra money going, mm -hmm. right? You'll have a legal way to start uh, proving that there is um, not not just financial abuse happening in that situation, but that the narcissist is untrustworthy, that they um, that they are purposefully trying to uh, keep resources from both you and the children, which again is another form of abuse. Okay, mm -hmm. and again, make sure that you are seeking outside help and support because financial abuse can feel especially isolating. Um, especially if the narcissist will use it as a way to punish you, right? Where they give you money to like go see your friends or something like that. But if you didn't do something that they wanted you to do, then they take away that money and now you can't go see your, your family or friends. You need to be vocal about what is happening uh, in your situation. And that can only happen when you're honest with yourself about the situation that you're in. So especially if you are a stay-at-home mom, Make sure that you are talking to yourself in a kind way, that you are taking uh, the necessary steps to rebuild your inner world in the way that you view yourself. You start calling things for what it is. This is financial abuse. Stop saying that my husband or my wife, they just um, handle the, the finances and I handle the things inside, right? They work outside the home. I work inside the home. That's great. That's wonderful. And that's a beautiful thing when it's done appropriately. But if the narcissist is trying to keep you from having any access to the information, you need to start calling that for what it is. It's abuse. When you start defining it as abuse, you'll start thinking about things differently. You'll start making different decisions. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and you'll start tracking things differently, right? And again, make sure that you're documenting everything. You want to send a follow-up text. You want to send a follow-up email. You want to make sure that you're having as many of these conversations with a third party as possible. You, This is necessary not just to try it. Some people think, okay, if I do that, then maybe they'll change. You know, Maybe they'll, they'll give me access to the bank account and they won't financially abuse me anymore. That's 
never been the case in my experience. However, if that's your your viewpoint, if that's what you're hoping for, then I support uh, I support your ability to make a powerful choice and think that that it will be the outcome. Um, if it isn't the outcome, worst case scenario, you have to go to court to find to, to get not only uh, financial support, but also to separate from the narcissist legally, then you will need a trail of, of, of information showing, of evidence showing that you have tried to, uh, to, to get on equal footing, right? This is not just that, oh, that's something that I have no interest in, which is, I've heard narcissists say that before. Oh, I've tried to include them in the budget. They just have no interest in doing it. I've tried to put them on the bank account. They just don't want it. They, they, it's easier when I just give her money or I just uh, a deposit X amount into her bank account and she can do whatever she wants with that money instead. The narcissist will always try to turn things around on you and it's important that you start, again, treating this for what it is. When you just think, okay, that person just doesn't want to give me access to it, it's not that big of a deal, It's it shifts your mindset when you start calling it abuse. Okay, so I hope this video has really helped you understand your next steps, especially if you're a stay-at-home mom. And, uh, and again, yes, is this going to require some work, some effort? Are you going to have to do things that you've never done? And can that seem very overwhelming or very um, intimidating? Yes, I understand all of that is true. You have to have that ideal life, that that goal, that vision that you are working towards as, as a as a reminder of why you are doing all of these little steps around, along the way in order to achieve your freedom. And if you are wondering why you feel like you're the crazy one, especially after you've left a narcissist, um, then I want you to check out this video next where I discuss this specifically, why you feel like you are crazy even though you know that this was a toxic relationship and you know that it was the right thing to leave, why are you still uh, having doubts? Why are you still feeling overwhelmed or feeling uh, like you're the one at fault? Check out that video and I'll tell you why.